In this video we're going to take a look at a few challenges from the Social Engineering Experts CTF. The first challenge is called Regex 101. It's a MISC challenge and the description says Our team stored a flag on a machine. However, we were hacked by someone and he generated 2,999 flags and hid our original flag in the .txt file. The flag consists of 5 uppercase letters followed by 5 digits and another 6 uppercase letters. Can you find it for us? So I've already downloaded the file and we can go and double check that it has 2,999 flags in it. And as was mentioned here, we need to use regex to try and find the correct one. So you could go to something like regex.com, which is quite good for testing regular expressions. You can see it highlights based on whatever regex you've got in here and it also explains the different options that you provide. I'm not going to do that in this case. This should be easy enough for us to do. So I'm going to open this up in Sublime flags.txt. I'm going to do control and H but you can do you can do this in notepad plus plus or something on Windows or whatever your favorite text editor is. It'll be a different command control and F or control and H or something. And you can see down here in the bottom left hand corner we've got an option for regular expression which says Alt and R for the shortcut so you could also use that to bring it up. I'm going to put in here C because we know this is how the flag format is and then in here we need to specify the criteria that it gave, so five uppercase letters followed by five digits, so we can use these square brackets to define a character class and we'll say here A to Z in capitals, so this is going to be any capital letters between A and Z and we want five of them, so I'll put that in curly braces to specify that, and then we want five digits, so I'm going to do zero to nine as a character class. You could also do like backslash D and that'll be a decimal as well uh, so I'll do that in, that in this case, so that's five of those and then there was six uppercase characters as well, six, six uppercase letters. So again we'll do A, Z and this time six and there we go, we've got our flag. The next challenge is called Baby Re and it's a reverse engineering challenge. The description says you've never seen a flag checker this helpful and we've got a binary to download, I've already got that downloaded, let's take a look at it. It is a 64-bit executable and we need to make it executable as well. Note that it's stripped here so we're not going to be able to see function names which simply means if we open this up in GDB and then do info functions. We don't see a main function or anything here, we can just see the imports from libc. Uh, so that'll make it a little bit harder to debug it but it's no problem. We could have a look as I usually do, just some basic checks here just to see what strings we've got. Do we have anything of interest, maybe a password in here that we can enter. We don't. We can try and run the binary. I'm going to do it with ltrace just to see what calls are made here and we can actually, okay it's taking fgets so we'll just enter something in here and it's checking the string length first of all. So we could keep running through this to find out what the correct string length is and then there might be a string compare done afterwards which we could then see what the correct password is but uh, that'll be a bit time consuming because we don't know what the length is. What I'm going to do instead is open this up in Geardra. So I'm going to do Geardra auto t to start this in temp directory and then open up the challenge. That's just going to quickly import and analyze the binary so that it'll just speed up the process a little bit. So Geardra open, we've got our decompiler on the right where our decompiled code was going to go. We've got our disassembled code here in the assembly window and then down here we can see our functions in the symbol tree so although we don't have a main function we can jump into this entry and we can see here this is essentially going to be our main function in fact let me rename that to main and then we know where it is. I'm going to open this up and then we can see there's a lot of variables being defined here on the stack they're all then being assigned values at the beginning and it's asking us to enter a flag so it's taking our input here so I'm going to say this is user input. I'm just typing L to rename that variable but you can also right click and rename. And now it's checking the string length so let's change that to input len. And it's going to make sure that the input len is 35 in hex. So you can right click to convert that to decimal if you like or you can just highlight it. It's actually 53. But if we check down here as well we've got this input length, string len, user input and then it checks if the input len minus 1 is equal to uvar4 um, so this is actually 52 the string length that we need to enter 
and we could go and verify that as well. Let me do cyclic uh, 52, generate 52 characters, and let's try and do L trace on it again. This time we enter in 52, and we can see that good work, your flag is correct, is the correct size. So we know we've got the correct size now. We can continue and try and find out what the correct value is as well. Let me move this over a little bit. So down here we can actually see that we have a counter. So this is incrementing by one each time. Uvar four starts off at zero and every time it goes through this loop, this do while loop, it's incrementing. So I'm going to rename that to I. I'm going to say that's our loop counter. And you'll see then that each time it's also assigning this variable which is user input plus I. So it's going through our input and each time it's getting the next character along. So let's say that is um, user input char and then it's also grabbing this one as well which is a local d8 so let me see that's where this uh, these values on the stack start so each time it's going to be going to the next value so let me go and change that and say this is the enc flag char so that's the current encoded or encrypted flag character and this is well this is the start of the flag but I'm not going to bother renaming that because it's only one variable that's going to show up and then it's converting this to a byte and then this is where the actual comparison is being done so it's comparing the current encoded or encrypted flag character to the user input character plus 45 in hex which is 69 in decimal XORD with BVAR1 which is the I so that's the let me change that to loop counter. Alright so hopefully that's a little bit clearer. Essentially each one of these encrypted flag characters is equal to our input plus 69 XORD with the current loop counter so I which essentially means that in order to reverse that we can just reverse the process so first we'll subtract 69 from the encrypted character no sorry first we'll XOR because at the moment it's adding that first and then it's XOR and we're going to do it the reverse order so we're going to XOR first with the loop counter and then we're going to subtract 69 so we're reversing that process and then that should get us to the correct character now there's a couple of different approaches that you could use here we could try to essentially copy and paste all of these values I'm not sure what the easiest way to copy and paste these is what I typically do if I'm doing that is just literally copy and paste these and then use regex to extract the values and put them into like an array in Python and then we just go and recreate this loop down here doing the same sort of thing. Another option is to go and set up breakpoints. So we could set up a breakpoint uh, around the comparison to see what's being done here. Uh, we can also see before it's adding the 69 and doing the XOR. So we could set up a breakpoint somewhere around here and go and step through and see what the value is each time. I'm going to opt for the first method which was to write a Python script but I'm just going to go and verify this first as well. Let's just go and check that out. So before it adds 69 and does the XOR, we can see that this value is moved from the stack into the ESI. So I'm going to take a copy of this address here. I'm going to open up GDB, Pwn Debug, and the challenge. Because the, I think, Pi is enabled, let me, let's try and do break RVA. 0x and then that address. So the program's not being run. So I'm going to run the program. I'm going to hit Control and C and then set that breakpoint up. And then we need to enter in some input as well. I'm going to do that cyclic 52 characters, which is the correct length, just to get past that first check. We'll hit Continue. We'll enter that in. I'm going to hit this breakpoint now where this is going to be moved into the ESI. So I'm going to hit, let's have a look at the ESI first of all. It's currently at uh, sorry, uh, RSI. So we can see it's currently got this string in it. And let's hit next and see what we've got now in the RSI. And it is 98. So let's go to Cyberchef. That's 98 in hex. So I'm going to put in here 98. And let's convert it from hex. And then we also want to sub 69 in decimal. So we'll sub 69. And you see the first character we have here is capital S, which is correct because we know that it should begin with a capital S. The next should be E, E again, and that's the start of our flag format. 
So if we want to try and see what the next one is, remember here that it's going to hit this, it's going to go down and have a look at this loop, and it's going to realize that the character we entered didn't match and it's just going to exit the program. So in order to ensure that matches, let me just, let's see what the comparison is being done down here. It is CL with SIL. So the CL is the lowest eight bits of the ECX. So ECX, so CL, and then SIL is from the RSI. So the lowest eight bits of the RSI. So it's comparing the RSI essentially to the RCX. We know that the value, the correct value here was moved into the RSI, the ESI. So we just need to make sure that the ESI also equals the ECX essentially. So what we can do here is go and say set ECX equals ESI. Let's hit continue. Okay, that didn't work. I realized why. It's because I set it to the ESI before we actually added the 69 and did the XOR. So even though the XOR is currently with a zero, so it wouldn't have actually mattered. But that's why that didn't work. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. We have the values here. This is the 98 that we grabbed. The next one is 8B. So let me go here and do 8B. I notice this isn't the correct value. We've got SF instead of SE. F is 1 above E, so let's go and... Well, essentially the issue here is the XOR, right? Because we needed to XOR it first with the loop counter. The current loop counter is 1. So now you see if we change that to 1, the first character is now incorrect, but the second character is correct. And then again, if we go and grab the next one, it's 88. So 88, again, that's incorrect. D, it should be E. But if we change this XOR to 2, now the third character is correct. So essentially we've verified what we're doing there, that's fine. Let's go and try and put this together in a Python script. So I'm going to open this up in Codium, exploit.py. And I'm actually quite happy about how this worked out. So normally what I would do here is copy and paste the values that we need either from Girdra or from GDB. But it does mean that you need to use regex to get out these variable names and in GDB. Sometimes it's a little bit easier in GDB where you can just copy and paste the, all the values. But in this case, these are all 4-byte variables and these are only 1-byte values in there. So essentially each variable has 3 bytes of padding, 3 0 bytes, which isn't good for us. In fact, if we go and have a look here at the section, you can see here, data section, this is the offset of the data section, which has the values in it. And you can see here, 9800000008B000000. So I'm not sure about the best way to deal with this. I was trying some different things in Pwn Tools, but let me just go back and explain for now. So we load the binary, just setting the log level here, and then our raw flag, we're actually getting the, we're going to the elf.data section, and then we're saying this is the offset, because if you remember here, we've got our offset 20F0. So we're saying from 20F0, we want you to grab 52 times 4 bytes because these are we've got 52 characters they're in 4 byte variables and then we want you to convert it to hex and I'm converting it to hex here let me actually just show I'm going to comment out some of this stuff I just want to show because it might be a better way of doing this which somebody can let me know about let me first of all I'm going to take this out I'm going to actually change that to print let's run that python exploit so we can see that the values are correct here. It begins with a 98, but we do have all these zeros. And I know that in Pwn Tools we can pack in different address sizes and unpack, so I kind of thought we'd be able to just convert these quite easily. But the method that I used instead, let me just paste this back in the original format. So we're going to convert this to hex, and in fact, let me just one more time, let me print that out as well. So converting that to hex will mean it looks like this. So there's a hex value. We could actually just go and do control and F and then take out the any time you see six zeros, take them out. But I essentially just did that in the Pwn Tools script instead. So you can see here that we're just replacing any instances of six zeros with nothing. So that gets rid of those three bytes of padding for each four bytes. And then we're going to unhex it. And that's going to be our encoded flag. 
and then we're going to loop through every character in the encrypted or encoded flag and we're going to decrypt it. So we're going to XOR the current encoded character with the loop counter which we know we need to do if it goes up each time and then we're going to subtract 69. So we're just reversing exactly what happens down here where it adds 69 and then XORs. We're going to XOR and then subtract 69 and then we're just going to append it to the flag. That's it. We're converting it to a character there as well. So let's try and run through that. We run through it and see our debug prints all those out and we get our flag printed at the bottom. I've got this set to debug but you could go and change this if you don't want all the output. So now it's on info. It makes it quite easy to swap between debugging and a less output. So yeah, if anybody's got a different way of doing this, I feel like there's probably a better way. Uh, so you can let me know. The next challenge is called Best Software and the description says, Help, I purchased a license for a software called Best Software. However, I forgot the license key to it. Could you help me? My name is CTF and my email is ctf at ctf.sg. Thank you. Uh, I didn't see this bit whenever I first did this challenge, so I was uh, stuck for a little while and you'll see why that is. Uh, I've downloaded the file already. Let's go and take a quick look at it. So we'll check the file type first of all and we'll see that it's a mono.net assembly. So typically if we have a Windows binary we would open it up in Gearder or IDA Pro or something like that. In this case we can actually decompile .NET assemblies by using some different tools. So it recommended the JetBrains decompiler here. I use DNSpy normally. So I'm going to move over to the Windows system to do that. We could also have a look at like the strings and stuff again. Uh, not too much point really. I'm going to jump straight over to Windows. Okay, I'm over on the Commando VM now, which is like a Windows version of Kali by Mandian. It comes with a lot of pen testing tools and stuff built into it. To be honest, it's a little bit overkill for CTFs so if that's all you're doing. You can also get a malware analysis version, similar to like a Windows version of Remnux, which is called Flare. Uh, but it's not really too important. As long as you've got a Windows system you can go and install tools on, you'll be fine. I'm going to go into the .NET section here and we've got this DN spy which is going to decompile this code. And let's open it up. We'll go in here, we can see we've got the program, program, and here's our best software program, and then here's our code. So we can go to our main function. Let me close this down. Oh. So we can see our code here, it's asking us for a name, an email, a license key and we can see that it's also going to do this check license key which is going to be important to us. We can see that we've got this I love C sharp here so it's taking the name that we enter plus I love C sharp plus email and then it's going to calculate a SHA-256 hash and then it's going to confirm if the license key equals the value that it's computed and here's the calculate SHA-256 hash. There seems to be something actually being done extra here because I tried to go and just generate the SHA-256 hash myself so take these values the name plus the secret key which is found in here as well and then go and do a SHA-256 hash on it and it didn't actually work I'm not too sure exactly what this is doing here but uh, there's another way we can solve this anyway we can actually go and set up a breakpoint so I'm going to set up a breakpoint right here let me if I can remember how to do it. Here we go. Add breakpoint F9 and then let's try to run the program. It's going to ask us for our name which we need to put in, what was it, it was CTF. The email was ctf at ctf.sg and it's asking for a license key. I'm going to put anything in here because what I want to actually see is what are they producing as the license key and you'll see that it's come out with this value so let's go and run that again I'm going to close that, I'm going to just open it up without the debugger I'm going to do name is ctf and the email is ctf at ctf.sg paste in the license key 
and there you can see that we've activated the license and we've got back our flag and we can just go and submit that now. The next challenge is called Formats. It's a pwn challenge and the description says let's get to know each other and it gives us a hint here about format string vulnerabilities that we can go and look into and we've got a service to connect to once we get things working locally and we've got the source code and the binaries to download so I've already got those downloaded let's open up the source code first of all and take a look at it so we can see our variables declared up here we've got a function get me which we'll look at that shortly let's just trace this in order of execution so we've got a main function it's going to start here it's going to read in a name from us and then it's going to give us these options do you want to press 1 or press 2 if we press 1 it's going to generate a random seed with srand using the current time it's going to generate a favorite number using rand modulus 1 million and then it's going to call guess me favorite number so that's that function here it's asking us to enter in a number a guess and it's going to compare the guess to the favorite number and if it's correct it's going to cap flag otherwise it's going to say not even close so we've got a seven digit number that we need or six digit number we need to guess essentially and if we look down here the option two is where the format comes in so you can see here I wonder is this actually you see there it's actually mentioning a vulnerability format string is not a string literal potentially insecure fix available so essentially the problem is here it's asking us what's the favorite format CTFs it's reading in 64 bytes into this format variable and then it's calling printf so because they didn't specify a specifier here it means we can do it instead so we could actually enter our input as like percentage s to print the first value of the stack as a string or should I say to print the string that the first value on the stack is pointing to or we could print it as decimal or as character or hex or we can use percentage n to actually do write um, write operations as well uh, so essentially that's going to be the option the, the goal here is to leak the value of the stack that's been guessed and then to submit it the problem that I had here this the immediate issue was that the it gets a new random value each time so let's say for example we go and say do you know me it generates this random value and it gets int favnum is equal to and then it does the guess if we then do two and try and leak that value off the stack it leaks the value off the stack and we've got the value but as soon as we do one again to go and submit that value it's going to do this again so it's actually going to change the value each time and we can verify that we can put together a little fuzzing script to verify that um, so let's take a look at that now I don't actually have a script yet put together for this so let me just show how we can adapt these scripts whenever these challenges come up so I'm gonna to go to the binary exploitation playlist on my github I'm gonna grab this fuzzing script I'm gonna open this up with codium fuzz.py and paste this in here we need to first of all change the binary name to vuln I can see here we're looping through 100 values but the issue is the input and output changes each time so if we run vuln you can see the first thing is asking us to enter in a name and we need to do that first of all so let me change here we're not going to create a new process each time the reason I have that is because if we're pr printing out the string because it's a pointer and it's going to try and print whatever the value on the stack is pointing to if that points to an invalid value so something that can't be interpreted as a string it'll crash the program which is why I have that set to create a new process each time but we're not doing that in this case we're just going to try and print as decimal because that's the value we're looking for so here I'm going to say p send line after and then let's see what it was asking for we need to put in a name I'm gonna put in here crypto and let's see it was after this colon so I'm gonna say after a colon send that in as a name and then let's see what comes up next it then asks us do you know me do I know you so let me see which guess my favorite number okay so we need to do that first of all so it can, can generate a random number so let's say let me get rid of this comment let's say p send line after 
I'm going to take a copy of this. Let's get, in fact, no, I'm going to take a copy of this second one because that's the last thing that's displayed. And we'll send after that. We want to do one because we want to, first of all, make it generate a random value. So we do that. It asks us to guess a favorite number. Let's just say one, two, three. And we basically want to do the same thing again here. So this time we're going to send a, well, first of all, we need to send off that random value. Sorry. So after it says, guess my favorite number, we will do exactly that. Uh, let me change this actually. The number that we put in there doesn't matter. And then it's going to go back to the main menu. And this time we're going to give it option two. And now it's going to ask us to enter in some values. So after it says, what is your favorite format? We're going to provide the format specifier. And actually, sorry, this is right here. So I'm going to paste this in here. And we don't want this to be in a percentage S. We want this to be percentage D to pr print it as a decimal. So this is just a format specifier. We can actually, whenever we're entering this in, we can do like percentage D, percentage D, oops, percentage D, percentage D, percentage D. And you can see it prints out the first four elements of the stack as integers, as decimals. We could print those as different values, but we can also do like percentage for dollar D and that's going to print the fourth element of the stack as a decimal. So you can do that as different formats. So we're looping through a hundred times and each time we're basically saying we want you to print out that value of the stack. Let's see what does it receive after that. So we want to receive, I think we want to receive two lines. Let's do p.receive lines two and then we want to receive a line, p dot receive line. And let's just see if we can just print that out. String result, okay. Let's try that. Okay, oh, we're closing the process, which we don't want to do. Do that again, it loops through and you can see that we've got our hundred values here with the indexes as well. We could actually, let me change that to, let's do dot decode. There we go. Uh, we could also strip the new line string result dot decode. And then we'll do strip new line just for formatting reasons. And you can see we've got all these different values then, right? So we want to try and find out what's particularly different each time. And notice that we have this 4551248, and then it goes to 1084, 1076. Let's run that again. Completely different values, but they're still incrementing, they're still within the same kind of range. They're also the correct length. So you can see that it's seven digits, and we know that that's what it's doing the modulus by. So these are the correct values. As I say, the problem which I came across here is we can leak this first value, but then if we go back to the main menu and submit this value, it's generating the random value again. So it's assigning a new random value. So the only thing I could think of to do here would be to leak the value and then go back into the menu. And in our script, we would have to actually use this rand and say, we want it to go to the next random value. That's the only way I could think of doing that. Maybe I'm completely missing something. Uh, but I think I actually solved this in an unintended way anyway. Well, I'm pretty confident I did because I didn't actually use the format exploit at all. So let me show you how I put this together. I'm going to take a copy of the script. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just importing the libc library and time as well. And you can see here that we're going to go through it. We're going to enter in our name. We're, going to, we're not even going to use option two at all, which is where the format vulnerability is. We're going to say we want to guess the value, and we know that what they're doing whenever they want to, whenever the, whenever a guess value is selected, 
we know that they're generating SRAND off the current time, so that's exactly what I'm doing as well. And then we know that they're generating a random value by module doing a modulus with a million. So that's exactly what I'm doing. And then we just submit that guess. And hopefully this will work for us. Let's try it out. Python exploit. We run through that cat flag and we don't have a flag, so it's saying no such directory. So let's go and update this to the remote server instead. We'll save that, run the script again, and we don't get our flag. Let me try it one more time. Okay. Uh, whenever I solved this yesterday, it came back like 9 out of 10 times. Let me go and, because there might be just a little bit of a lag, in fact, let's take a copy of the server address and port number. Let's see if the server's running a bit slow here. Crypto, do you know me? One. Guest favorite number, one. It actually seems quick enough. All right, let me go and try and put in a delay anyway. So before, after we send off saying we want to guess the value, let's just put in here sleep one, sleep for a second. Let's try that again. And there we have our flag. The next challenge is called weiyang.py and the description says infinite sky as a service. So again, like the other Pwn challenge, we've got a service to connect to once we get things working locally. I've already downloaded the files and we have a Python file. So let's open it up. Open this up, we've got some terminal output. We've got a flag file, which is set as flag in capital letters. We've got some options here that we can enter. The first one prints something out, the second one prints something out, the third one prints something out. The fourth one is asking us what file name we want. It's going to set our input as the file name and then not allowed is being set as char for char in flag file which was up here so flag. So flag is not allowed in there and it's going to then go through each character in the file name we entered and see are any of the characters in that flag file in there. If so it's going to say nice try and it's going to cat news.txt otherwise it's going to eval it's going to call system and eval our file name. So let's go and try this out. We can test this out locally. Let's do Python Yang, and we want four, which was the oh no, sorry, we want five. Oh, oh, we do want four. Okay, I'm confused. Maybe I put in three last time. Yeah, I put in three. Okay, so four. Which news article do you want? So if we put in here flag, it's going to say nice try because we put in some invalid characters so let's jump over to Hacktricks. I've got a link here to the Python sandboxes page which as you can see here there are some tricks to bypass Python sandbox protections and execute arbitrary commands this is like a pi jail challenge and we've got some different commands that we can try in here we have let me scroll down we know that our code is already being evalved, so here are some potentially interesting things. If this is being evalved already, can we put this in as the file name? Let's try it. Let's do uh, 4. It asks us for the file name. We put that in, and it has listed the files in the directory, which is good. So let's take a copy of the server address and the port number. Let's try it there, and we could take a copy of this again submit that and you can see that it lists the files in the directory but we want this flag and we're not able to enter in that character we also have my flag as well we could try and do that let's do four uh, let me go back here and say cats my flag try that okay maybe there was nothing in my flag uh, but yeah, we're going to run into the same problem, but you can see here that what we can actually do is we can try Octal or Hex or Base64. So let me go to Cyberchef and let's say we want to convert flag and we want to make it into Hex. We want it in the format with the backslash X. So we'll take a copy of that. And in fact, let's just try now and just say we want to request that file for we put in that file name okay nothing there okay uh, so let's try what we were just trying let me go 
take a copy of this and let us do that again. We'll do option four. Oh, okay. Don't know why that happened. We'll do option four. It asks us for the news article. We'll paste that in. We'll go back and we'll say cats and take a copy of these hex values. Paste those in. And there we've got back our flag. The next challenge is called ASDF. And the description says, why use a Python interpreter when there are online ones? And we've got a server address and port to connect to. We know it's a Python interpreter, so we could go in and start grabbing some commands from Hacktrix to throw at it. But let's go and connect to it, see what we get. It asks us to enter commands, so we can just try something basic first of all. It prints out A, let's try and print out something invalid. And we get your input sucks, okay, let's try and do something like eval. And you can see that actually exits it. Alright, let's try and print globals. And we get some output. I'm going to take this over to Sublime. And let's see, we've got a blacklist here. So it's printed out the globals and then we can see, we can see the file name here and we've got a blacklist. So these are the words that we're not able to enter. So anytime we do that, it's going to print out nine and then exit the connection. So what we could do is go and try and do this in hex again, like we did previously. Let's go and hex eval. and make it backslash x take a copy of that and just try and enter it and see do we get okay so we get your input sucks but if we do it not in hex we get 9 and it closes let's reconnect and I'm gonna go to hat tricks so we can take a copy of this built-in dict which we're gonna print out and then we'll take a copy of all this I'm going to go over to Sublime just to. I'm just looking for the first angular bracket. So I'm going to go over here and let us replace a comma with a new line. Oh, replace all. Just makes it a little bit easier to go and look through what we've got here. And if we do that, we'll see that we've got eval. We've also got exec as well. We've probably got some other stuff here that we can use to get code execution. So we can then put this together. So I'm going to go put together a payload. Let me take a copy of this and open up Sublime again. I'm going to paste this in here. And we basically want to use the index then of eval. But we can't say eval, we need to use the hex value. So I'm going to grab a copy of those. So we can now eval, and then we want to essentially say what we want to eval. So we can go and grab this from Hattricks. Essentially, we can use something like import os.system, and then we can do anything we want from here. So we could just list the files in the directory, or we can cat flag. That's fine. We also need to make sure this is encoded though because remember we've got that blacklist. So I'm going to take a copy of this and take a copy of that. Paste this in here and then hopefully if we paste this in. Oh. Okay, we've missed some of the hex values we need. Let me go and paste this in. And there we've got our flag. The next challenge is called Easy Overflow and the description says I did a check on my return address, now you shouldn't be able to control my RIP. And we've got a server to connect to and again we've got the binary to download so let's go and take a look at it. The first thing I'll do here is run checksec which I didn't do on the previous challenges but it's good practice just to find out what protections are enabled on the binary 
In this case we've got NX enabled which means we're not going to be injecting any shell code onto the stack because it'll be marked as not executable. We don't have PI enabled so the binary is going to have the same base address each time it loads and we don't need to worry about tripping off any canaries. We could also potentially overwrite some elements of the global offset table. And apart from that we've got 64-bit binary so let's go and take a look at it. I'm just going to jump straight into Geardra which I've already got open with the binary. Let's go into our main function. This challenge actually took me quite a while to solve and I'm going to go through it basically the order of the things that I tried, the ideas that I had and how I debugged the problems when I came across them. I might not get everything right because there were some elements of the challenge which confused me a little bit but uh, I got the flag anyway so let's see how, how we did it. Uh, I'm going to rename this first of all with L to buffer which you can see this is the 32 byte buffer of the main function and we can see that we've got this f gets call down here but it's actually reading 8 bytes in so you can just highlight f gets here and see what those parameters are so the first thing is the pointer so the RDI is going to contain the string pointer of where f gets is going to write to and then the int is the size so it's going to read in 8 bytes and then the file is the stream so where it's going to read it from and this is our RDI, RSI and RDX but that's not where our buffer overflow is because we can see there that's 8 bytes being read into a 32 byte buffer there's no overflow let's have a look at this vuln function which also has a 32 byte buffer so I'm going to rename that and typically what we do here because we can see this dangerous gets call it's not going to check to make sure whatever we enter into this buffer is actually going to fit so we would aim to override everything that's in the buffer and anything else that's on the stack any of these local variables in this case we've got an 8 byte variable there so we'd want to override our 32 bytes and then our 8 byte variable and then the saved RBP from the previous function and then we're at the return address which if we overwrite that return address whenever the return statement is called here it's going to return to the address that we've placed in uh, that we've overwritten there on a the stack. Now the problem here in this case is we have this in stack 0 and it's checking to make sure it's going to equal 401212 we can actually go and have a look and see where that is 40 one two one two is right here so you can actually see the call to vuln is at one two zero d it's going to make that call and then whenever it returns it should return to the next instruction and it's just making sure here that actually this should be set to that address and if it's not exit the program so if it exits the program there's nothing else we'll be able to do so how can we get around this well let's go and see how I tried to debug this to begin with I'm going to open up Codium exploit.py just in case anybody hasn't watched any of these CTF videos before this is just a Pwn Tools template which I use most of the stuff up here doesn't change at all except the name of the binary and then the login level if you want to this just makes it very easy to swap between debugging and remote and local as we'll see during the video and you can set up breakpoints and stuff here for your GDB script I've actually set up a couple of breakpoints we'll see what they're about shortly enough but essentially you don't need to worry about what's up there what we need to worry about is what's in this exploit goes here section we can see we're going to launch the binary we're going to build up a payload and we're going to send that off as our first payload the second payload we've just got set to just enter in a name for now so based on what we just discussed if we were to go back here what I would think to do would be to write 32 bytes of anything so like 32 A's and then overwrite this 8 bytes with the correct value and then overwrite the return address so if we were to do that let's go back and we wouldn't just be overwriting the return address there so it would be 32 bytes and then 8 bytes for the long and then 8 bytes for the RBP and then the return address so if we were to do that let's just try let's do 32 times and I'm going to do B oh, bytes and we'll do 32 times A and let's see what happens if we do the correct value. What was it? 401212. 0x401212. This is going to flatten this into 60 into a 64-bit address because the context is set here. So it knows what the architecture of the binary is, and it's going to do this for us using this flat function. So I was thinking we would do this, and that would correctly overwrite the variable on the stack and then let's overwrite the saved RBP with just anything and then let's do our 
win function. Sorry, I haven't even mentioned that yet. So if we go to functions here, we've got another function called win and it's going to call cat flag. So that's the goal is to make the program, redirect the execution of the program to this function. So let's set that to elf.functions.win. Okay, so we save that. We'll go and run the exploit and see what we get. Because we've got the login level set to debug, we'll get a lot of output. And we're running into... Okay, so we hit naughty boy there. So the problem was, let's go back to our code. If we go to our vuln function, remember if we don't ensure that this meets, that this is the correct value, we're going to get that naughty boy. So that was the first thing is, I would have thought this should be, oh sorry, this should, yeah, 32 bytes. Did I do that right? Let me double check. Yeah, 32 bytes in should be the value that we want to overwrite there. So to debug this, let's go and open up GDB, pwn debug, and the binary. Let's generate a cyclic pattern of, let's say, 40 bytes. We'll do 50. We'll take a copy of this and we'll run the program. It's letting us overflow it, so I'm going to paste that in. And we got naughty boy. Okay. Well, we want to see what's actually, whenever we do that, what is the value whenever the compare is done. So let's have a look here. The compare is here if stack equals, and you can see it down here, compare. So I'm going to take a copy of this address. 11A1. Oh, it's, well, let's do break 0x40. I was thinking break RVA there, but it's fine. Oh, we need a star just to denote the address. And let's run it again. Let me take a copy of that cyclic pattern. Let me change the background so it's a bit easier to see it. We'll paste that in. We hit this breakpoint, and here's the comparison being done. It's comparing RAX to RDX. Currently, our RDX is set to what it should be. So this is the address that it's comparing it to. So this is the value that we have here, the literal value that's being compared. And this is our in stack zero. So you can see here, RAX to RDX. The RDX is main is being loaded in and it's adding 46 bytes. So it's, that's the offset from main that it's going to. And let's go and let's go and see what the offset of this is. So in the RAX we have KAAA. So we'll do cyclic dash L to look it up. And we'll find out that's at 40. So the offset of the return address and the and the value that's being compared is 40. So this is where I start to get confused because if we go back to our script and we change this to 40 then. We're doing 40 and then we're writing in this value. I'll just leave the other stuff as it is and let's send that off. And you'll see that we get end of file here. So we get good boy because it's detected that we've got the correct value that it's expecting in the RIP here. But then it goes back to the main function and the main function just calls fgets and then we get an end of file. So the next thing that I was thinking here, let me just grab an article which I did a video for the Integrity Cake Challenge, which was a pwn challenge and off by one vulnerability, similar to this one here, where basically we couldn't control the RIP, but we could control one byte of the saved RBP. And if you take a look through, this is a quite a good article explaining that, but if you take a look through this, essentially what we find is whenever we have this leave and ret instruction, let me go back to, let's go back into our vuln. So whenever the function leaves, we're going to get our, where's our return? We're going to get our leave and then rep. And essentially what's happening at that point is the leave instruction is going to pop the corrupted EBP. So if we overwrite the EBP, that's going to pop that in, sorry, it's going to move the current EBP to the ESP and then it's going to pop the corrupted EBP onto the stack which is fine. It's going to go back then to the main function. It's going to return to the main function, which we know it's going to go to... It's going to return here down to this... Uh, sorry, after vuln, it's going to go down to here. So 401212. It's going to return there, but then we've got another leave and ret instruction at the bottom of the main function. And what's going to happen when we get there? So it's going to go to the main function, and then when it gets to the end of the main function, it's going to 
move the corrupted EBP to the ESP and then it's going to pop that to the EIP which is what the RET instruction does. So essentially, oh, I've probably not explained that very well, but essentially if we can only overwrite the RBP, which we know we can because the RBP is before the RIP on the stack here, we've got our 32 bytes, we've got this in stack variable, we've got our RBP and then the return address. Although somebody can maybe explain this for me. This doesn't actually show as a is it because this this doesn't actually this isn't actually taking up any space here. So actually our RBP is at 32 bytes in and then at 40 is our RIP. So if we were to overwrite at 32 bytes in, let's say let me try and explain this with an example. So let's do 32 bytes, that's filling up a buffer. And then let's say we want to overwrite the saved RBP with elf.functions.win. And then let's say it doesn't really matter too much here. Well, we, we know that we need our the correct return address because it's going to check that and it's going to return. But then this corrupted RBP is going to be popped. And whenever we go back to the main function, when it gets to the end of this function and hits this leave return, that will cause the, the corrupted RBP, which contains our win function, to be popped into the RIP and it'll execute, start executing there basically. Hopefully that makes sense and was correct. Um, let's just see what happens though whenever we try to do that. So this is what I was kind of hoping would be able to fix this. Let's try and run it. Python exploit, we get an ender file. So we want to go and try and debug that and find out what's going wrong. What I did here, you can see I've set up two breakpoints, the 4011CA and 247. So the 247 is the leave instruction of the main function, and the other one is the leave instruction of the vuln function. So we can actually trace through this and see what happens. And because we're using this template, we can use this GDB mode quite easily. So we do Python exploit again, but just type in GDB in capital letters at the end. And that's going to hit our breakpoint. I'm just going to minimize this stuff so we can see it a bit better. I'm going to hit enter to go into this breakpoint. And essentially what we're seeing here, this is the leave instruction. So what's going to happen is we can see here push RBP and it's actually pushing the win function, which is what we want to see. We'll hit next and keep going. That's gone to our return instructions. It's now going to return back to where it's supposed to in the main function. So let's hit next and keep going. We hit next, it's going to call puts in a second. I keep typing n just that habit there, but you can actually just repeat the previous instruction by hitting enter. So you can see it's going to call puts. Okay, we'll hit enter again. And what we're interested in, remember, is at the bottom of this function, we're, we're wanting it to get down to, let me go back again. We're wanting it to get down to this return. If it gets down to this return, our win function should be popped into the RIP and it should be executed. But we need to get through this stuff first. So let's go back there. Let me minimize it. Let's go back. We'll go next again, next again, next again, next again. And here's the issue. So look at what's actually happening here at the moment. Is Remember our f gets call, if we go and have a look at it. f gets should be reading 8 bytes from a standard input from us into the buffer, which is a, a pointer. So it's a point, char pointer. And it should be pointing to our buffer, as you can see here, the buffer. But if we actually have a look at our at what we have, it's pointing to 401.229. Now we could do disassemble. No function contains a specified address. Let me do that 401.129. What is at that address? So it's pointing to this move ESI 8 to ESI instruction, which is obviously not right. We can't we can't write into that. So whenever we hit next again, oh let me do it. Whenever we hit next again, we're going to hit this error because we simply can't try. We can't write into that area of memory. It's part of the program's code. So what we can do is go and try and work out what's going on there. 
and the way I did this was to use a cyclic pattern. Let me go back to... Oh, you've actually got a couple of options here. You can do cyclic in the terminal and then just copy and paste that, or you can actually just do it straight into Pwn Tools. So we can just say here cyclic 40, for example. And if we try to send this off again, oh, cyclic 40, but we need to make sure our 401212 stuff's in the right order. So let's do this again. GDB, I'll minimize this stuff and we'll step through. We could have actually set up the breakpoint at F gets instead just to make this a bit quicker, but it's fine. I'm going to hit next. I'm going to hit next, 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 all the way down to our F gets. And this is what we're interested in is what part of our cyclic pattern has made it into this string pointer. And it's the IAAA. I don't know why it's made the first bit of capital, but um, that's fine. Let us do a cyclic lookup, which you could also do in Pwn Tools, but we'll do it here. IAAA. And we can see that's 32 bytes in. So we're writing 32 bytes, and then whatever the next 8 bytes are, i.e., our saved RBP, are then being used as the pointer. So we could put in an address here and say, we want you to write whatever is read from that fgets call. We've got this fgets. We can decide where that's written to. So we can find somewhere in the program's memory that's writable that uh, we can write from the standard input to. So we can go to our global offset table, for example. We know we've got some functions in here which we could overwrite the address of some of the functions. This is actually the got.plt, but we'll access the got address from our Pwn Tools script and we could say here that we want to, for example, let's say we want to write into puts so we could put the address of puts and then whenever we're asked for the standard input we could put another address and we can say we want to overwrite the address of the global offset table entry for puts with the address of system or in our case win because if it was system we need to also make sure we're able to put in like bin sh or something in or cat flag or something into the RDI as a parameter. Okay, so let's go try this with the global offset table entry and we'll do it with GDB again to see what happens. So we'll do, let me reset that back to 32 A's and then we want to put the address of our global offset table dot, uh, sorry, elf dot got dot puts and then we need to have the address of the the correct address of where it should be returning to. It's going to return and then whenever it calls fgets it's going to be reading into elf.got.puts and what does it read in? We want it to read in the elf.functions.win address and let's see how that goes then. That means essentially that the next time puts is called, let me go back sorry, um, so it calls fgets we write the win address over the puts address and then right after that puts is going to be called. So puts is just going to call win with the buffer in it which shouldn't cause any issues. Alright so let's try that out with the debug mode on and see, in fact let's try it without the debug mode first of all. We run through that and we don't get our flag so now let's try it with the debug and see what's going on. We'll minimize this, let us hit enter, we'll go next, here's our return. We can see that the RBP is pointing to puts in the global offset table, so that's good. We can also verify now, let's have a look at our global offset table as it is. You can see here puts is pointing to puts, we want puts to point to win. So let's hit next. Let's go next, 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 all the way down to F gets. And this is what's interesting here is actually this is pointing to 403 FF8. Let's try and do disassemble. No function contained at that address. So it's not actually reading into the correct place. Let's go back. What I'm going to do is just try it with a different global offset table entry. So let's just out of interest try it with gets. We'll run through it with GDB again. Let's hit enter here and 
This is pointing to the gets of the PLT, which is good. Our gets is currently pointing to gets, which is as it should be. So let's hit next and let's do that until we get to our F gets call. We get to our F gets call and we have puts in there, puts at the global offset table. So this confused me for a little while. Let's just see what happens next anyway. Let's hit next. Now that should have overwritten the global offset table puts address then with the win address. So now I'm going to do got again and look at this. We've got puts is pointing to win which means the next time puts is called and you can see puts is called right here it should print us the flag so we'll hit next we'll hit next again and it's going to call puts but actually it's calling win we hit next and there we go so we can try this again let's do this with gdb off and you can see it's tried to print the flag it didn't print it because I don't have one locally, so let's go and grab the server address and port number. Because we're using this cool template, we can just now say remote in capital letters, paste in that server address and port number, and that'll run off for us, and you can see we get back our flag. RIP is king, RBP is queen. So as far as I'm aware in terms of what happened here, let me just go back and show our F gets call. In terms of whenever we put in got dot gets it actually turned out to be got dot puts well the only thing that I could determine here was that we have the RAX is loaded here with buffer and RBP plus minus 0x20 so 32 bytes and whenever we go into our global offset table we can see we've got puts here which is ending 18 and then we have gets ending 38 so it actually seems that the that was 0x20, so hex20. Oops, let me go back. And that's exactly what's being subtracted here. So I think that's basically why we needed to use gets in order to overwrite puts there. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, which I might be, uh, because as I say, it did take me a little while to get my head around this challenge. Uh, but yeah, if you solved it differently, let me know. The next challenge is called Sniff Traffic. It's a forensics challenge and the description says We inspected our logs and found someone downloading a file from a machine within the same network. Can you help find out what the contents of the file are? So we've got a file to download. It's a PCAP file in this case. So I'm going to open it up with Wireshark. You could use T-Shark if you want to use the command line. So we can open this up. A few things I normally like to check is the protocol hierarchy to see what kinds of data we've got. We can also have a look at the file properties so we can see how long the PCAP went on, how many packets have we got, what was the time span. We can also have a look at the conversations and see what conversations we've got between different IPs on what ports and different protocols and stuff like that. We can right click and then select any conversation or follow stream and whatever conversation we want to look at. Uh, so yeah that's a couple of things I normally like to try unless the PCAP is particularly short. In this case, let's go back to our protocol hierarchy. We can see we've got HTTP here as 1.1% of the traffic. So let me apply that as a filter, selected. And now this is all our HTTP stuff. So we can go scroll through. And if we do that, we'll see down here we've got this get thingamajig.zip. So I'm going to right click it. I'm going to go follow HTTP stream. Open this up. And here we can see this begins with PK, which is the file extension header for a zip file. So we want to extract this, but we need to do it in raw format. So I'm going to set that to raw. I'm going to take a copy of what we want to save and then save as. Let's save this as extracted.zip. Let's close that and we can now go and have a look at our zip. Let me try and do unzip. Oh, we're not in the right directory. Let's do unzip extracted. It asks us for a password. Okay, so we don't know what the password is. We could try blank, we could try password, stuff like that. We can try and use zip to John, which will generate a, oh, we need to provide the file name, which will generate a hash that we can crack with John. However, this doesn't work for some reason. I'm not too sure why. We could also use fcrackzip, which is like brute force in the password rather than hash cracking. 
and you can use fcrack zip. I'm going to open up Control and G. I'm using the Navi tool here, which can install some cheat sheets and stuff into. So that I can now just type fcrack zip, hit enter, and it asks us what's the file location. The file location is here, and it's extracted.zip. And here we go. So it just puts together that command for us. We can try and run it, but we see that it's not the correct format. Let me try and do dash H. So we could try and change this to zip1. Where is the format option? Validate version. No, not version. Character set, dictionary, brute force, method. Okay, so we could try and change that and say, let me go back towards the start here and do dash m1 no usable files, we could do it with zero as well and no usable files again, alright so the password is obviously in the pcap as well, let's go back and take a look I'm going to go back into the protocol hierarchy and the other thing that's interesting here is data, anytime you see data that's probably interesting, so I'm going to select the UDP data let's go and take a look at it, we've got a couple of conversations here so if I try to right click on the first thing here and do follow UDP stream there's nothing of interest in there but it doesn't mean there's nothing of interest here at all so let me just go back to what we just had filtered UDP oh let me just change that to UDP and can I do UDP.data maybe that all alright I don't know what the filters for that. Let me just go back here, right click on Alright, we want yeah we want the data. Applies filter selected. It's just data, okay. But we do want UDP as well. Uh, anyway, there's a UDP conversation I think towards the end and you can see here please don't be please don't break the wall. So I'm gonna right click that. I'm gonna go follow TCP stream oh it was a TCP okay. Uh, follow TCP stream and you can see here it's telling us that the password is this following string of hex characters or a hash or something so we'll now unzip it we'll paste that in we've now got stuff so let's see what file type is it's data let's print it out and it doesn't look too readable let's do strings dash n10 on the stuff and we'll see this flag.txt is mentioned in there so Let's try and do foremost or bin walk, which will try to extract any files that are embedded inside that one. We can now go into output and we'll see we've got another zip. So we'll go into zip, we'll unzip this one, and again we've got a password to enter. So let's try zip to John again. Zip to John. It generates the hash this time, and it's a very short hash, so it looks like we'll crack that very easily. Let us do zip to John and we'll pipe that to or we'll output that to hash oh sorry we need the file name what was it called it's not even giving me the autocomplete it's called 01 okay and we want to output it to hash there we go and now we can just use John hash and we need to provide a word list so dash dash word list equals user share word list rock .txt. and very quickly we find that the password is John okay so let's unzip it password John and we've got flag.txt we print it out and there's our flag the next challenge is called sourceless guessy web baby flag and the description says why so serious why need source Contrary to the title of this challenge, you do not need to guess. Do not brute force or scanner infrastructure is not allowed. And it tells us there are two flags for this challenge. Uh, they're actually separate into two separate challenges. You can see this one over here, the RCE one, which I've not done yet. And we've got a domain to connect to. We'll open it up and we can see that it sets the page immediately to this parameter. So let's try and change that to etc password and it doesn't look any different let's try and do some directory traversal so if this is not in this is probably in var www html and maybe another directory so let's go dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash try that again we can see some of the etc password in here and there's our flag a little bit hard to see so we can actually view the source if we want to 
go and zoom in and we'll see that's our first flag, the second one we need RC4. The next challenge is called Super Secure Request Forwarder and the description says hide your IP address and take back control of your privacy. Visit websites through our Super Secure Proxy. And we've got a hint that it's to do with SSRF as the name would indicate. And we've got the source code to download for this one, we've got the server to connect to. I've opened up the Hattrix page for SSRF which you can go and have a look through, you can see this is one of the first things that I tried was to see if we can access just like the file either etc password or can we just put in file flag but we get back this message that the URL you entered is dangerous and not allowed so we could continue going through here and trying different protocols but seeing as we've got the source code in this case let's open that up I've already got this open in Codium and one thing that I saw Hilbert mention on a recent video it's worthwhile checking the requirements.txt and seeing what versions are being specified so in some cases you'll have a specific version being specified rather than the latest version which is obviously a good thing to research if you're looking for vulnerabilities in this case let's just jump straight over to our app.py and take a look at the code so we can make a get or a post request to the root directory if it's a post request we provide the URL parameter with the URL we want it to access and you can see here it's got comments saying prevent SSRF and it's using advocate so we'll need to go and have a look at what this library is about shortly so it's going to try to get that and then it's going to render the template and it's either going to say the URL you entered is dangerous and not allowed or it's going to make the request so this is basically first of all checking to make sure the URL we provide is safe and if it is it'll then make the request on the URL otherwise it's going to say it's dangerous which was the message that we saw whenever we tried to access the file so we can go and try a lot of different things there we need to basically see how this advocate library works and we can see that the goal here is to access the flag root but we need the IP address to be it needs to be from the local host in order to get the flag from the environment variable so we could go and have a look at some of the cheat sheets as well I went and tried to set the IP in a lot of different formats so we should be able to see here that we can try to bypass some of these restrictions by using like IPv6 format or octal or hexadecimal you know different formats um, we can use something burp intruder or some kind of fuzzing tool although um, you're advised against it in most ETFs to run through some of these different formats uh, but yeah, none of that stuff worked anyway. Um, let's see first of all if it can access a external address. So I'm going to use python-m http.server and let me do this on port 1337. And then we'll expose that to the internet. So I'm going to use ngrok http oh, 1337 and this is going to give me an external address that I can provide so if we enter this in you can use something like request bin as well just online without needing to set it up in your terminal and you can see we can now access the directory and if I go back to the terminal we can actually see that we've got the request here so this is used for XSS challenges and stuff where we need to exfiltrate cookies and things like that and you can see that there was two requests made so let us let's try and actually serve something. Let us do codium exploit.js and I'm just gonna try and put in here a script alert zero. Let's save that and let's try to access exploit.js. So that returns and we do get the pop-up. We can have a look at the source and see that we do indeed have the script in there. So at this point I actually tried a lot of things with scripts and with iframes and stuff to see if we could access the flag but I would always get this forbidden message or some errors with X-frame options and things like that. So we can go and take a look at the advocates Python GitHub 
Maybe see if there are any issues open or if there are any closed security issues. Or just have a look at the code and see how it's processing things. Issues is always a good one to check first. Don't see anything mentioned there with the security. I did have a look at this IP address package. There are some security issues with some versions of that. But uh, this didn't really help too much. Let's go back to the source code. So we could have a look through some of this. Let's go into advocate and into the address validator. So there's a lot of commented stuff in here, particularly stuff to do with the IPv6 to 4 and 4 to 6, which would kind of suggested to me that there might have been some vulnerabilities around here, but uh, I was going down a rabbit hole anyway. My teammate ended up solving this challenge. Let me show you how that went. So I'm going to open up the script. It is app.py. So we can basically set up this Flask application and we know that whenever we supply a URL, it's sending it to Advocate first, which is going to check to make sure it's not malicious. And if it's not malicious, it's then going to make the request itself. So essentially, you can use our own app to provide the URL, and we'll basically have this check set to true to begin, in, to begin with. So the first request that comes through, we'll just send through a benign response and then we'll change the check variable and the next request that comes through will send a malicious request which is a redirect to the flag. So again they'll open up the URL, they'll scan it and see okay we've just got this text here saying it's benign and then they'll say okay it's safe let's make the request for real and that time we'll send it something malicious. So that's about it. You can see we've got the command here that we can use to run this. We need to go and get a new ngrok session. Let me close these ones down and let us do port 5000. I'm going to go and set this up as, let's go back, let's do a flask run. So that launches that and then we're going to do ngrok on port 5000. We can also op up, open up the web interface to go and have a bit more of a detailed look at this. Let me take a copy of the ngrok address it's given us. We can go and update this here. Oh, I've got that in correctly. And essentially we can just go and provide this as the URL, right? So let's go to the service again. Let's search for that and that comes back with our flag and we can go and have a look then with ngrok let us let me refresh this so you can see it got the first request we got 200 okay we sent back this benign response and then it made the real request and we sent it a 302 redirect and told it to go to the local host flag anyway that's going to wrap it up for the social engineering expert ctf you can check out the github repo if you want to have a look at any of the scripts that have been used in this video, it'll be in the CTF events folder. It's not listed yet, but it'll be up by the time this video goes up. And there's some pwn challenges in here as well. If you're interested in learning the basic binary exploitation, you can check out the, oh, not that one, the binary exploitation 101 series. So there's a series of challenges in here and videos to go with them. And also I recommend the ROP Emporium series, which is a bit more advanced. I did make some videos on that a year or two ago. They're not great quality videos, but the scripts are very well commented, so if you're trying to do those challenges yourself and get stuck, then hopefully these will help. Anyway, thanks for watching. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.